patience, a word that uh, has a bad reputation. Among Christians, we joke about uh, not wanting to pray for patience, that uh, uh, it's going to be a, a difficult process if we ask for such a thing. But it's patience that we see being taught by God to many of the characters in Scripture, including the character Abraham in the 16th chapter of Genesis, where uh, we see him and Sarah, uh, at this time Abram and Sarai, uh, being uh, tested by God. Uh, they have been promised that in their old age that they're going to be given children, that they will actually, though childless now, will become the parents of a huge nation of children, that nations will look to them as uh, their ancestral parents. But the pragmatism of the day, the reality of the moment, was that they were well past childbearing age and had not yet had children. And so does one continue to wait patiently for God to exact his promise? Or does one begin to reinterpret that maybe what God meant was such and such? Maybe he meant a different path. And that's the challenge before uh, Abram and Sarah as we enter into the 16th chapter of uh, Genesis. And I want to invite your attention to that this morning. I want us to see uh, through this text and through many others the purpose of patience why it should not be an optional thing that we dread for God to teach us, but actually is a key component to all that God would have us to know, to do, to live, and to obey. Genesis 16 begins, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. Now just as a side note, it's a, a, a fascinating little study here to see how Genesis 16 lines up with Genesis chapter 3. Because in both cases, you see a husband and a wife uh, doing other than God's purposed will for them. In both cases, you see that Eve brings a suggestion to Adam and that Sarah brings a suggestion to Abram. That in both cases, Adam uh, heeds uh, the uh, advice of his wife and that Abram heeds the advice of his wife. And that in both cases, therefore, they fall short of what God had intended. They sin, they disobey God. Now, where did Sarah get this idea to usurp God's plan, to uh, do an end run around God's direction for them? I think it may have happened back in Genesis 12 when uh, Abram demonstrated that for Sarah by going down into Egypt and bypassing trust in God for their own protection and safety. You see, as the leader of the clan, as the leader of that family, Abram was being tested then. And his failure in that test set an example for his family just as strong as a successful test would have set. And for those of us who are heads of our families, for those of us who are in positions of leadership and in positions of influence, understand that you set examples, either positively or negatively, that imprint themselves on those over whom uh, you see, on those over whom you're responsible. And so it may well be that Sarah's actions are the result of her having seen her own husband in time past take a different path than the one God had ordered for them. So, verse 3, Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. Now notice this for just a moment. Sarah, 
took Hagar, the Egyptian, her maid, and gave her to be Abram's wife. And notice what the scripture says. Abram had been 10 years in the promised land. In other words, for 10 years, God had been taking care of Abram and Sarah. For 10 years, he had been meeting their needs. For 10 years, though they had not fully experienced uh, the conquering and the conquest and the ownership of the promised land, they're still strangers and, and uh, 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 tribesmen in a foreign land. Nonetheless, they are experiencing already some of the blessings and benefits of having obeyed God. And I think it's in that context that the narration here wants to point out that it's not as though God had made this suggestion and had not followed it up with protection, but in fact, for 10 years, they have left their homeland and have found themselves alive, well, healthy, and wealthy under the direction of God, and still their impatience causes them to go around God's plan for them. Verse 4, or verse, uh, yeah, 4, so he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Now, Hagar was the maid to Sarai, and uh, neither one of them had had children. Uh, certainly, Hagar knew of Sarai's uh, barrenness, and when Hagar saw that she was being blessed with a child, it caused her to develop uh, uh, despiteful feelings uh, with Sarai. Uh, really, chapter 16 is the story of women. It's the story of these two strong women. Uh, one, Sarai, uh, determines that she has her own plan to be able to raise children. Notice what she says back in uh, verse 2. She says, please go into my maid, Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. But then when you go down to verse 15, it says, So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. Three times there in those two verses, the Bible lets us know that though back in verse 2, Sarai had launched this plan in hopes of having herself a child, that her name's not even mentioned here. That the child comes under the name of Abram. Uh, we see in this even some protection that Abram has. Sarai carries out a plan. It, it uh, works exactly as she has laid it out. But you know, sometimes when things work out exactly the way we planned, we're still miserable. When we, our plans are not God's plans for us. Everything is working out perfectly the way Sarah uh, has <coughs> uh, planned it to happen. And yet, friction develops in the family between Sarai and Hagar. So much so that the scripture goes on to tell us that Hagar runs. She leaves while she's uh, still expecting a child. And uh, the uh, geographical locations that are given to us in 16 let us know that she's headed back to Egypt. But as she is uh, resting on her flight back to her homeland, the angel of the Lord, perhaps a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ himself, comes to her, calls her by name, and says that I am going to bless that child that you are carrying, that he will be the father of nations, and that you need to go back and submit yourself to Sarah. And so she returns, she gives birth, she begins to raise this child under the protection of Abram. And Ishmael becomes Abram's pride and joy. Abram's uh, expectation that maybe it is through Ishmael that God is going to bring this blessing. Uh, Abram uh, uh, is the proud father of this young man, but not as the result of God's purpose and plan, not as God would have intended it. For we know that Ishmael gives rise 
to the modern-day Muslim population. We know that Isaac's family and Ishmael's family today uh, lie in complete contrast and bitter enemies with each other. And the, the, just the small detour of Abram's plan uh, results not only in, in disharmony within their own family, but eventually disharmony in the promised land itself. Sarah, rather than just waiting on God however he would choose to do so, to carry out his purpose for her, impatiently sets about a plan and a course of action that falls far short of what God purposed and planned. In fact, God will carry out his purpose. She will much later, some 13 years later, will still conceive and give birth. God will bring his plan into fruition in his time. It's just not our time. It's not Sarai's time. It's not Abram's time, but it is God's time. And as such, God teaches Abraham primarily a powerful lesson. And it's the lesson I want us to look at this morning. And that is the lesson of the purpose of patience in our lives. Now, as we look at that, we need to draw some vital distinctions this morning. A vital distinction between divine punishment and divine chastisement. Because I think often we get those two confused. There is a huge difference between divine punishment for an action and divine chastisement for an action or a lack of an action. Patience is brought by God to us through chastisement, not through divine punishment. It is important for us to know the difference between the two. It's important for maintaining the honor and glory of God and for the peace of mind of the Christian. It's vital for the believer to understand that uh, the distinction between divine punishment and divine chastisement is very simple, but it's often forgotten. And really, it's simply this. God's people can never, ever be punished for their sins. I want to let that soak in. Because I think that is met with some disbelief in our hearts. God's people can never, ever be punished for their sins. Now that, that well, no, wait, 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 wait. You know, God has to get... This is the difference between divine punishment and divine chastisement. God's people can never, if you are a child of God, if you are a child of God, you can never, ever be punished for your sins. Why? For God has already punished them at the cross. Now, if, if the cross was not important to you before that statement, I hope it begins to loom large over your life to realize that the sins you committed this morning, you will commit tomorrow. The sins that you are hiding even from God, Jesus paid for that on the cross. He didn't just die so you could have a ticket to heaven. His death paid the penalty of all your sins. It's fully paid for. 1 John 1, 7 tells us that the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. All sin. And my friends, neither the justice of God nor the love of God will ever permit Him to again exact a payment for what Christ has already discharged on the cross. You can never ever be punished for sin. There is a distinction between the two. You see, in divine punishment, God acts as a judge. In divine chastisement, God acts as a father. 